Hello and welcome. So we've built up to one of our main tools in economics. We've introduced each of the components of that tool individually, the supply curve and the demand curve. So what we're going to do today is put all of those together. And we can do that because, first of all, the demand curve is a relationship between two things, the price of something or the willingness to pay for something and the quantity of that something that you will want to purchase. The supply curve, similarly, is a relationship between the willingness to pay for something that you might be willing to provide and the quantity that you would be willing to provide. Because these two curves are relationships between the same two things, that means that we can put them on the same graph together. So let's do that. First of all, we have our supply curve that slopes upward. That's our law of supply. The higher the willingness to pay for something, the higher quantity that you're willing to provide. Or in other words, the more that you incentivize something, the more people are willing to do. Here's our demand curve. The demand curve slopes downward. That's our law of demand. The more you have to give up for something, the less you're going to be willing to do. Now putting these together gives us a representation of the market for one good or service. In this case down here, let's say it's the market for apples. Now putting these two curves together gives us something called an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. These are our two main descriptors of the market for apples. We know something now about the price of apples and the number of apples that get sold in a market. Now when we talk about equilibrium price and quantity, what I don't want us to do is just look at the intersection point. The intersection point does represent an equilibrium, but I also want us to know what it means for something to be an equilibrium, because equilibrium is not just an economic concept. Equilibrium is a concept that's applicable to physics, to chemistry, to biology, to engineering, all kinds of different fields. So what do we mean by equilibrium? All equilibrium means is that we have a stable point. We have a system with some number of variables in that system, and if we disturb one of those, it's going to return back to that stable point. So for example, a thermostat is going to be an equilibrium system. If you leave the door open when it's snowing outside, the temperature in your house is going to fall, and the thermostat is going to notice that. There's going to be some sensor in the thermostat that is going to kick on the heater, and that's going to raise the temperature until it gets back to the set point of 72 degrees in this case. On the other hand, when you leave the door open on a summer's day, the thermostat's going to notice that again, and mechanisms are going to kick in that are going to lower the temperature. In this case, the AC is going to come on. So in order to call a system an equilibrium system, there are two elements to this. First of all, we have to know the variable that returns to equilibrium, and second, we have to talk about the process that gets us back there. In the thermostat's case, the variable is going to be temperature, and the mechanism is going to be the AC and the heater, respectively. Here's an interesting example of an equilibrium system. This is a diagram of a machine from the Industrial Revolution. Now the big innovation in the Industrial Revolution was the ability to harness steam power. But steam power has a lot of problems that come with it. Most importantly, it's kind of variable. You could be boiling some water, and there's going to be moments when the steam pressure is super high and your machine is going full force, and then it's going to kind of peter out for a little while after that. So the pressure of steam power is going to be going up and down and up and down, and it's going to be hard to run a machine that way. What this contraption does is it stabilizes the steam pressure. So when steam goes through this pipe on the left, that pressure is going to spin this wheel. And because of the centrifugal force, those balls on the side are going to rise up. When those balls rise up, that's going to choke off a valve at the end of that pipe, and that's going to cut off the steam pressure. Now on the other hand, when the steam pressure falls, less pressure is going through that pipe, the wheel starts spinning more slowly. And so without that centrifugal force, the balls are going to fall back. When they fall, that's going to open the valve more and let more steam pressure through. So again, in this case, we have both elements of an equilibrium system. We have a variable that returns to a set point, in this case, steam pressure, and we have a mechanism that gets us there, that responds to disturbances in our variable. And that's going to make it a lot easier to run a lot of machines that could be steam powered.
Here's another example. Your body is full of equilibrium systems. Now, in biology, they often talk about homeostasis. Homeostasis is just another word for equilibrium that has more syllables, so we like the word with fewer syllables. This diagram describes an equilibrium system with respect to blood sugar. When you eat a cupcake, your blood sugar rises. Now that can cause organ damage sometimes if your blood sugar is too high for too long. So when your blood sugar goes up because you ate something sugary, your pancreas is gonna notice that. It's gonna produce a hormone called insulin that's going to tell your liver to absorb more blood sugar and take it out of your blood. And so your blood sugar returns back to the a stable and sustainable point. On the other hand, you've been sitting all day watching economics lectures and you haven't eaten since this morning, your blood sugar might be pretty low. And so if your blood sugar is pretty low, you feel kind of tired, you feel nasty. And so in order to get you through, your pancreas is gonna notice that low blood sugar and start producing this chemical called glucagon. Glucagon tells the liver to release some of that glucose into the bloodstream and raise that blood sugar, at least until you feel good enough to make it to the next meal. Here's another equilibrium system in your body, temperature. The human body has a set temperature of 98.6 degrees, at least when it's healthy. Now what happens if I wander outside in the snow without a coat? Certain things happen in my body automatically. I'm gonna start shivering. When I start shivering, that generates mechanical energy that raises my body temperature. The hair is gonna stand up on my skin to keep some of that heat in. My blood vessels are gonna constrict to keep in the heat that might otherwise be lost. On the other hand, if I'm out on a summer day playing volleyball, then my body temperature is gonna rise above that set point. And again, certain mechanisms kick in. I'm gonna start sweating. And what that does is the evaporation of the water takes heat off my skin. My blood vessels are gonna dilate, allowing heat to be released more easily. And this is gonna happen until, again, that body temperature returns to that set point. So in this case, again, we have a variable, blood sugar or temperature, and we have mechanisms or processes that return our body to those set points whenever anything disturbs that system. For example, eating a sugary meal or being too cold or too hot. So now let's take it back to economics. The intersection point of a supply and demand diagram is indeed an equilibrium. Not just because it's an intersection point, not just because that's where your eye goes when you look at the diagram, but because it's a stable point. Now on a supply and demand diagram, that intersection point, that equilibrium point, usually indicates the point where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. There is one price where if you draw a line across, the quantity supplied where that price hits the supply curve is gonna equal the quantity demanded where that price hits the demand curve. So why is this an equilibrium? Imagine a situation where the price was not at that intersection point. For example, if the price was too high, all of a sudden we have a situation where the quantity supplied is much higher than the quantity demanded. More people are willing to provide this good or service than there are people willing to buy it at that price. We're gonna call this a surplus. And a surplus is a disequilibrium situation where not everything that's being produced is getting sold. Now imagine that you are the manager at the grocery store and you notice that cereal's piling up on the shelves. How do you react to this situation? Well, it makes sense for you to mark that cereal down, to put it on sale, or to lower the price of that cereal. What happens when you cut that price? Well, people who weren't willing to buy that cereal at the higher price are gonna be more willing to purchase it at the lower price. So quantity demanded is gonna increase. But you also react to this as the supplier of cereal. You say, I bought too much from the wholesaler, I can't get rid of it at that higher price, and so I'm gonna purchase less from the wholesaler next time, and I'm gonna supply less to customers going forward. So when you cut that price, not only does the quantity demanded increase, but the quantity supplied also falls. Now you're gonna have a built-in incentive to cut that price until quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And that's gonna be true no matter what you paid for it, because it's better for you to sell that cereal at a loss than it is for that cereal to go stale on the shelves, because then you get nothing for it, right? And we'll talk later in the class 
about other situations where businesses might be willing to sell below cost. Why in this case? Because the cereal that you purchased from the wholesaler is just a sunk cost to you. You've already bought it, you can't change it anymore. And so it's better for you to get what you can than to insist on a high price where some cereal is going to go to waste. So why do we call this an equilibrium point? Not because nobody has to make any decisions, right? You made a decision as a store owner to cut that price, that's true. However, what makes this an equilibrium is that you are acting in your own interests. It makes sense for you to cut that price. We're not assuming that anyone has to aim for equilibrium. In fact, nobody has to do that. Nobody has to get together and say, hey, we're out of equilibrium, what do we do about this? All we need is people behaving rationally. And again, somebody behaving rationally just means that they're doing the best they can in that situation. And that's all we need in order to tell a story about why an equilibrium price falls out of this process. On the other hand, now imagine the price is too low. We have a price below the equilibrium point where quantity demanded is going to be higher than quantity supplied. This means that more people are willing to purchase this good at this price than there are people willing to provide it. We're going to call this a shortage. Now, a shortage in economics is not a normal situation, and shortage is not the same as scarcity. When we talk about scarcity in economics, scarcity is omnipresent. Everything is scarce. That means that there's not enough of anything to do everything we would want to do of it if it were free. If we cut the price of something to zero and let people consume as much as they wanted to, there's not enough of nearly anything to make that possible. That's different from a shortage. When we talk about a shortage in economics, a shortage is not normal. A shortage means that there are people who can't get what they need at the current price. Scarcity means there would be a shortage at zero price. Shortage means there's not enough at the current price. And we're only going to see shortages if prices are prevented from adjusting, prevented from doing the work of coordinating people. Now, if you've ever been to the Renaissance Fair, one of the things they have there is these giant turkey legs. And they're pretty delicious. So imagine that you're at the Renaissance Fair, you've been having a long day of running around dressed up, and now you're hungry. So you're going around from booth to booth. Each one of them says, turkey legs, $3, sold out. You're getting pretty desperate here. Your willingness to pay for a turkey leg is pretty high. So finally you come across the last booth. They have one turkey leg left. And there's a guy already there kind of haggling with the owner. He says, I don't know, three dollars, I could take it or leave it, I'm kind of ambivalent. You know, he's waffling. What do you do in this situation? You run up and you say, wait, I'll pay five dollars. Now, why are you willing to do this? Because if your willingness to pay is higher than five dollars, you'd rather get it at five dollars than run the risk of not getting it at three dollars. So what does this do when you bid up the price? First of all, quantity demanded falls. This guy who maybe kind of sort of was interested at three dollars, maybe he was the marginal demander at three dollars, now he's out of the market. Five dollars, he says, nope, that's too rich for me. You can have it at five. So people who would have demanded it at three now don't. So quantity demanded falls. But what else does this do? Now all of a sudden, some of these booths that were selling metal brooches or soup bowls or something like that, now they look at, oh, turkey legs are selling for $5. Now it's worth it for us to get in on this. And so quantity supplied is going to increase. There's going to be more suppliers willing to sell at $5 than there were at $3. Now again, you'd rather pay $3 than $5, but you'd rather pay $5 than not get it at all. And so again, what makes this an equilibrium? All we're assuming here is that people behave rationally. People try to do the best they can in the situations they're in. And that's why we call this automatic. Even though there are decisions going on here, everybody's acting in their own interests. Nobody has to tell anybody else what to do. And just people behaving in their own interest rationally is going to push that price back up until we get to that point where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. So the intersection point is special, not just because the eye is drawn to the center, but because when the price is anything other than that equilibrium price, that implies an arbitrage opportunity. You can either bid up the price or somebody else is going to bid down the price and there's going to be convergence across all the booths at the Renaissance Fair. They're going to be forced 
by arbitrage to offer their goods and services at an equilibrium price that's consonant with the market as a whole. And until quantity supplied equals quantity demanded, there's an opportunity for somebody to do better for themselves. Now, just like we've talked about with arbitrage before, when all arbitrage opportunities are exploited, that means we're using our resources efficiently. We're satisfying the most possible wants and needs with those resources. Same thing is true here. At this intersection point, we're satisfying the most possible wants and needs. I'll show you that geometrically later on. But if the price is anything other than that equilibrium point, that means we are wasting resources. Now I want to talk about some of the stories we can tell with a supply and demand curve. But in order to start telling stories here, we have to be very careful about cause and effect. Specifically, what are we going to be satisfied with as the first step in a story we tell? Now the axes of a supply and demand diagram are price and quantity. That means price and quantity are the things that we want to explain. Price and quantity changes are going to be the last step in a supply and demand story. We are never going to want to start with a price change. Why not? Because there are two reasons a price could change. For example, if a price rises, that could be because the supply curve shifted back. We have a fall in supply. Or we could have an increase in demand. For the story we tell, it's going to matter which one of those occurred. And there are going to be opposite implications in those two cases. So we can't start a story by just saying, you know, the price of something rose, therefore the market changes this way, right? We have to explain why the price changed in the first place. Now, of course, we can talk about the effect of price changes on other markets. That's what we've been doing with substitutes and complements. But if we're looking at one market, we can never start a story with a price change. This guy here is Scott Sumner, who writes a popular macroeconomics blog, and one of his mantras is never reason from a price change. This means that we can never start a story by saying the price changed and therefore X happens, right? Price changes do not cause supply or demand shifts. In fact, it's always the other way around. Supply and demand shift, therefore the price changes. So a supply and demand story is gonna look something like this. Some event happens. Let's say there's an improvement in technology that's gonna make suppliers more willing to produce at any given price. So they change their behavior regardless of the price. We're gonna shift the supply curve right. This is gonna have several effects. The price is gonna fall, right? When our intersection point changes, people change their behavior until quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. In this case, that's gonna to lead to a lower price. When the price falls, quantity demanded is gonna increase. And so consumers are reacting to that price change. We don't move the demand curve when the supply curve moves, but we move along the demand curve. Consumers are reacting to this, but only through the price change, not regardless of the price. Now, in actual fact, these three things tend to happen at the same time, or at least in very quick succession. But it's important that the first step is always going to be number one and not number two. So this guy wants to tell you a story about the effects of price changes. He says the price of gas goes up and this affects the economy in X, Y, and Z ways. Don't be this guy. We never want to start with a price change because it matters whether gas prices are increasing because of a fall in supply. Maybe some pipeline got blown up and now it's harder to get gas. Or maybe the demand increased. And the effect on the economy and the effect on the gas market is going to depend on why prices increased. So the price change is what we want to explain. It's not the thing that we use to explain other things, unless we want to go into other markets, for example, substitutes and complements for gasoline. So let me walk you through a few examples here of the kinds of stories we can tell with a supply and demand diagram. Let's take in all of these examples, the market for apples. So let's imagine there's a drought. When we have a situation like this, the first question we want to ask is, who does this affect regardless of the price? If there's a drought and the price of apples doesn't change, does this affect consumer behavior? As a purchaser of apples, I don't care if there's a drought. The only reason I care if there's a drought is if that affects the price of apples. So that being the case, the demand curve is not going to move. Consumers are not affected directly. Who is affected directly? If there's a drought and 
the price of apples stays the same, suppliers are gonna be willing and able to produce fewer apples at any given price. So this does directly affect suppliers. So we're gonna shift the supply curve backward. What does that do for us? That's gonna to lead to an increase in the price of apples. Apples are now scarcer. You can still get an apple, but the marginal value is higher because there are fewer of them. And so if you want one, you're gonna to have to give up more for it. The opportunity cost of an apple has increased. This also means that the quantity sold of apples is gonna fall. At that higher price, I'm gonna be willing to purchase fewer, or at least somebody in the economy is going to be purchasing fewer. How about this example? Let's think about a substitute for apples and how that might affect the market for apples. Let's imagine the price of pears falls. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we couldn't reason from a price change. That's true if we're talking about the price of apples. We can never talk about the price of apples changing and then the effect that that has on the market for apples. What we can do is talk about the effect that a rise in the price of other things has on the market for apples. In this case, suppose the price of pears falls. It could be because the demand for pears fell or because the supply of pears increased. Either way, some of the demand for apples is gonna spill over into that pear market. There are gonna be people who were willing to buy apples if pears were pretty expensive, but now if pears are cheaper, people are gonna say, hey, pears are looking a little better now. I'm gonna buy fewer apples, more pears. So this is gonna affect people's willingness to pay for apples, regardless of the price of apples. And so we're gonna move the entire demand curve backward. What effects does this have? The price of apples is gonna fall and the quantity sold of apples is gonna fall also. We're gonna move down the supply curve, quantity supplied is gonna fall. And the reason for that is because at this lower price of apples, suppliers are willing to produce less. So apple farmers are gonna look at this lower price of apples and say, hey, I'm not getting a whole lot for apples. Maybe it would be more worthwhile for me to grow something else like pumpkins or something. How about this example? Imagine that Martha Stewart writes a new cookbook and this is full of delicious autumn recipes that all use apples. So this cookbook is a smash hit. Everybody's trying to make apple pie and apple cider. So this is gonna affect people's willingness to pay for apples, regardless of the price. At any price, people are gonna be willing to purchase more apples. And so the demand is gonna rise. When the demand rises, the price is gonna rise. Apples become scarcer because people value them more, but also the quantity sold of apples increases. We move up that supply curve. Why? Because at this higher price of apples, producers are willing to say, hey, let's take away some of that land from the pumpkin patch and start growing apple trees there instead. Last example, let's imagine a technology improvement. One of the ones that we talked about before when we talked about supply versus quantity supplied. Let's imagine a new mechanical harvester of apples is invented that allows the harvesting process to go a lot quicker. This is gonna increase producers' willingness to sell apples at any given price. At a price of $1, producers are gonna be willing to sell more apples than before. At a price of $5, producers are gonna be willing to sell more apples than they were before. So supply is gonna increase, and consumers are gonna to react to this through the price. They're gonna look at this lower price and be willing to purchase more apples at that price. Again, not because consumers care about the mechanical harvester as such, they don't, but because the price tells them that now apples are less scarce. So the price falls and the quantity sold of apples rises. Now, when we tell these kinds of stories, there's a common trap that I want us to avoid. Sometimes people think of supply as a synonym for availability, or they think of quantity as a synonym for availability. That's a trap. What is a supply curve? Supply curve shows willingness to sell. How much are you willing to sell at $1, at $5, at $100, at 10 cents? And that's gonna depend on productive opportunities. That's gonna depend on alternatives and substitutes and complements in production. That's gonna depend on marginal costs. But let's imagine there's an increase in the demand for apples. What this does is it makes apples scarcer. Apples become less available. And so what you'll be tempted to say is that this reduces supply. Nope. You might be tempted to say this reduces quantity. Nope. What this does is it increases the scarcity, but that's not the same thing as quantity or supply. Where is the scarcity of apples reflected? 
that's reflected in the price. So when apples become less available, when apples become scarcer, that's reflected in a higher price of apples. But in the case of a demand increase, this actually leads to more apples being sold, not fewer. So when we talk about supply, supply is willingness to sell. Quantity is the number that gets sold, not the number available. So if you're tempted to say demand increases, therefore supply decreases, remember, one curve is never the cause of the other curve shifting. You can never tell a story like demand increases, therefore supply decreases, or supply increases, therefore demand increases. Never going to tell that story. Why? Because the entire point of drawing supply and demand curves is to separate out different factors that can cause prices to change. So it's important that we keep our story straight, right? Because telling a coherent economic story is going to depend on making sure we're telling stories that are consistent with rational behavior. And by being careful about cause and effect when drawing our curves, we can make sure that our stories make sense in terms of the actual decisions on the ground that people are making. So what's the point of supply and demand? What does this tell us? Well, of course, we can explain changes in prices and changes in the quantity sold of things, but so what? Supply and demand is ultimately a story about coordination. We spent the first part of the class talking about how an economy coordinates plans. I make plans to consume things. Somebody else is making plans to produce things. Are those plans compatible? If they're not compatible, we're going to be wasting resources. Either they're going to produce too much, or I'm going to be disappointed in my plans to consume. I'm not going to be able to finish that. My plans to consume have to be compatible with other people's plans to consume. If you and I both plan to consume the same resource, at least one of us is going to be disappointed. So why do we care about changes in prices and quantities? Because the price that falls out of the process of supply and demand is the one that coordinates producer and consumer plans and coordinates consumer plans to each other and producer plans to each other. So economic efficiency requires that we adjust our behavior to scarcity. When something becomes scarcer, people have to consume less, or that's going to motivate people to produce more. What mix of those do we pick? Who takes the hit when something becomes scarcer? Prices do two things. First of all, they give people the information to adjust their behavior to scarcity and to act in efficient ways. And second of all, they motivate people to act in accordance with that information and to use their resources efficiently in ways that satisfy the most possible wants and needs. So the price that falls out of supply and demand, you can think of them as communication mechanisms, right? A price communicates information about scarcity down the supply chain to you. You don't need to know anything about the war in Ukraine, about pipelines in Canada, about drilling wells in Saudi Arabia. In order to adjust your behavior, with respect to gas consumption, all you need to know is the price of gas. That's enough. And so you're going to react in an optimal way to, for example, events like a pipeline being shut down or a war, right? All of a sudden, there are more valuable uses of gas on the margin, and that higher price of gas tells you to cut back whether or not you have any idea why. That's a good thing, right? Similarly, Prices are going to communicate information about consumer preferences up the supply chain to suppliers. How do producers in an economy know what to produce, how much to produce? What they're doing is they're forecasting on the basis of what prices they think they can get for the things that they sell. What does that tell them? That tells them how many wants and needs and how urgent wants and needs they can satisfy with their productive resources. So money prices are going to motivate producers to look for efficient ways to satisfy the most possible wants and needs. In a situation without market prices, what does an economy look like? This is going to be our command economy that we've talked about before. Without prices to coordinate behavior decentrally, that is to say without somebody telling people what to do, it's going to be basically impossible to solve the problem of optimal resource use and satisfying wants and needs. And so resources are going to get used in ways that are wasteful, that could satisfy more wants and needs, but don't. So this dual function of prices, of providing information both to you and to producers, and 
of motivating both you and producers to act in ways that try to create the most possible value. It is the only way that we know of to solve the problem of economic efficiency on large scales. So in a regime of property rights, where we have incentive compatible institutions, where the best you can do is to be honest about the intensity and the urgency of your wants and needs. This aligns the value of the opportunity cost to you with the value of the opportunity cost to the economy. Remember the opportunity cost to you of a decision is whatever else you have to give up in order to get something. In the case of the market for a good or service, that's the money you spend on that, that you could have spent on something else. What's the opportunity cost to the economy of you making that decision? Well, when you buy something, when you consume an apple, that's an apple that somebody else can't consume. That's the opportunity cost to the economy. And so an equilibrium price is going to align the opportunity cost to you with the opportunity cost to the economy. The value of what you have to give up in the future is going to align with the value of what had to be given up to allow you to satisfy that want or need. And that's going to motivate you to make efficient decisions. And by efficient, we don't mean that you have to be super ascetic. By efficiency, we only mean that you are making decisions only if the benefit is higher than the cost. If the cost is higher than the benefit, we don't want people making those kinds of decisions. So prices are what motivate people to voluntarily avoid overly costly decisions. Right? If I don't value the apple more than the next person who would have gotten it if I didn't eat it, then I shouldn't be eating that apple. Now the magic of prices, again, is that I don't have to know anything about why the price is what it is. When I react to a high price of gas by deciding to take a shorter trip rather than a longer one, I'm reacting in an optimal way to geopolitical events that I have no idea about. And that's a good thing, right? We want people to be motivated to act in efficient ways without having to know everything about why this good or that good is scarcer or less scarce. Now I want to come back to this question of efficiency. Now I promised I would show geometrically that the equilibrium price is efficient, that it creates the most possible value out of those resources. Now remember when we talked about consumer surplus and producer surplus. Consumer surplus is the value created by everybody who's purchasing something in a market. If I value something at $20 and I get it for $10, that's $10 worth of value created. So you add all that up, everything below the demand curve and above the price, that's our consumer surplus. For sellers, if I'm willing to sell something for $1, but I managed to sell it for $10, that's $9 worth of value created for me. And so adding that up across all sellers gives us producer surplus. That's the area of the triangle above the supply curve, but below the price. Those two triangles together represent the value that's created through trade in this market. If this is the supply and demand for apples, this is all the value that gets created by the production and trade in apples. So then what's special about equilibrium? At equilibrium, these triangles are as big as they can possibly be. We are creating as much value as possible out of the production and distribution of apples. So let me show you that any disequilibrium price is actually going to decrease value. So what might cause disequilibrium? If there are built-in incentives that lead people to automatically get back to that equilibrium price, when are we ever going to see a disequilibrium price? Well, sometimes there can be laws that prohibit buying and selling at the equilibrium price. A price floor makes it illegal to sell below a certain price. And a price ceiling, on the other hand, makes it illegal to sell above a certain price. So these kinds of laws might cause prices to persist at disequilibrium levels. Now let's think about what kind of effects these laws might have. Let's start with price floors. In a price floor, we have a price that's higher than the equilibrium. Why do we call this a price floor? Because, well, you can't go below the floor. You're standing on the floor. So at this too high price, quantity supplied is high. Producers are very willing to provide this good or service, but also at that high price, quantity demanded is low. Not a lot of people are willing to buy at that high price. That difference between quantity supplied and quantity demand we call a 
surplus. This looks like cereal piling up on the shelves. This looks like unsold inventory. Now, when might we see price floors? One very common price floor that we see, especially in developing countries, but also sometimes even in developed countries, is agricultural price supports. When farmers of a certain good are very politically powerful, sometimes they can lobby to make it illegal to sell that thing below a certain price. Now, of course, that sounds great in principle, right? If you can force everybody to pay you a higher price, life's good, right? What's the problem? Well, at that higher price, more people are gonna come in, try to compete, but there's not gonna be enough consumers to buy all of what gets produced at that higher price. And so that's gonna lead to surplus and waste. In fact, did you know that the United States has a strategic cheese inventory? Where did the US get this strategic cheese inventory? As it turns out, there were price floors on dairy products for a while in the US. And so there's this huge surplus of cheese that's not getting sold. Now, the dairy lobby in this instance was very politically powerful. That's how they got the price floor passed in the first place. And so they said to the government, hey, people aren't buying cheese at this higher price. Can you help us? And so the government stepped in and bought all this surplus cheese. If you've heard the phrase government cheese, that's where this comes from. And this was distributed as military rations, in school lunches, and in various other ways. But this was not an efficient use of dairy resources, right? Let me show you this. At this higher price, consumer surplus is gonna be much smaller. There are gonna be people who are willing to pay this higher price if their willingness to pay is high, but there's gonna be fewer of them and they're gonna get less benefit out of this transaction. Producer surplus, on the other hand, is gonna be bigger. Producers enjoy selling at higher prices. So one effect of a price floor is that it transfers some value. Some value gets taken away from consumers and transferred toward producers, right? This consumer doesn't wanna pay that high price, but his willingness to pay is high enough that he's gonna pay it. He's just not gonna be very happy about that. This producer, on the other hand, right, life's good for this producer. That's why this producer was trying to lobby for this price floor. Now, if this were the end of the story, maybe there are situations where you'd wanna transfer some value from consumers to producers. But that's not the end of the story, because in addition to transferring some of this value, there's another more important effect. Price floors are also gonna prevent some transactions from being made entirely. So this guy would have been willing to purchase some cheese at the equilibrium price, but now he's priced out of the market. And so he's gonna to have to do without. He's gonna to have to go to a substitute that's less good. So he loses out on some value that could have been created. But it's not just consumers that lose out. Now this producer is willing to make cheese at this high price, but now there's no consumer who's gonna be willing to purchase it. So these folks could get together in principle, right? There's an opportunity for positive sum trade here. Both of them could be better off, but this transaction is prevented by this price floor. And so value gets wasted. This waste in value, we're gonna call deadweight loss. Deadweight loss is gonna be this triangle that represents transactions that could have happened, value that could have been created, but now is not because of this disequilibrium price. So deadweight loss happens any time that there are transactions that could have happened, but now don't. This means that we've missed out on some potential for value creation. And that means that we are being economically inefficient. We could have satisfied more wants and needs, but now we are not. Now, if you are skeptical, that sometimes there are situations where people really wanna transfer values away from consumers and toward producers. How about this? How about the minimum wage? What does the minimum wage do? The minimum wage is a price floor on labor. This transfers value away from consumers of labor, namely employers, and toward producers of labor, namely employees. Now, when people advocate for the minimum wage, they're thinking of this transfer effect. They're thinking, you know, stick it to the corporations, and if that's all it was, that would be one thing, right? But what's the other effect? What's the more important effect of price floors? Not just the transfer, but the deadweight loss. So this difference between the quantity supplied of labor and the quantity demanded of labor, we call that unemployment. At that higher wage, there are more people who wanna work, but there are fewer people who want to hire. 
So price floors cause unemployment and it causes deadweight loss, right? Unemployment is wasteful. There are people who want to work, who make plans to find a job, but those are not being coordinated with plans to hire. And this guy might want to hire somebody, but can't swing it at the higher minimum wage. This guy wants to work and is willing to do so at a wage that works for the guy who wants to hire him, but it's illegal for these two guys to get together and make that positive sum trade happen. This means that labor is being wasted and the economy overall is worse off than it would have been in the absence of a minimum wage. Now we'll talk later about other ways to help struggling workers that don't necessarily involve a price floor, right? You can do other things like subsidizing labor and that's gonna shift the demand curve for labor or people sometimes talk about a universal basic income that's gonna shift the supply curve of labor by providing people better alternatives, better substitutes. Why is this better than a minimum wage? Because the minimum wage discoordinates people's plans and results in economic waste. And so if we want to help workers, the minimum wage is the worst way we can do that. Price controls in general are one of the worst things we can do. And we're gonna to wanna to look for other ways that don't result in discoordination and waste. Now, how about price ceilings? Price ceilings are a situation where the price is mandated to be lower than the equilibrium price. We call it a ceiling because you bump your head on the ceiling. You can't go above the ceiling. Now at this low price, quantity demanded is gonna be high. A lot of people are gonna be willing to purchase, but quantity supplied is gonna be low. Not a lot of people are gonna be willing to supply. This results in what we call a shortage. Now again, shortage is not the same thing as scarcity. Everything is scarce. Things can become more or less scarce and the price is gonna reflect that. But we only see a shortage when the price is too low. A shortage means wrong price. A shortage means you are willing to pay the current price, but you can't get it. Now that's bad news, right? That's inefficient. You're making plans that you can't finish. And there's value that could have been created that now is not being created because the price is not doing its job of coordinating. Now you might be tempted to say, well, wait a minute, price floors made the area of these triangles smaller. So maybe price ceilings are gonna make the area of this triangle bigger. But that's not actually true. Why? Because where is the value created in a market? Value is created when there's actual trade, when there's a transaction, when something gets bought or sold. And if there are more producers than consumers, or more consumers than producers, which of those determines how many transactions occur? Well, it's whichever one is lower, right? So anything that reduces either quantity supplied or quantity demanded is gonna reduce the number of transactions that are happening, right? It's only the minimum that matters. So the story of price ceilings is gonna be very similar to our story of price floors, just in reverse where price floors transferred value from consumers to producers, price ceilings are gonna do the opposite. Value is gonna get transferred from producers to consumers. Because you as a consumer, you're gonna be excited to pay this lower price, right? The producer, there are gonna be some low cost producers who are still willing to sell. They're gonna be less happy about this. They're gonna get less for this, but there might be some who are still willing to sell and they get some amount of value from that. But it's not just the transfer. Just like the price floor, in addition to this transfer effect, we have this deadweight loss effect. The transactions that are prevented from happening due to the fact that quantity supplied is limited by this low price. So here's somebody who would be willing to pay the equilibrium price, but can't find anything. This would be you at the Ren Fair looking for that turkey leg, but you can't find it because that guy who was paying $3 for it got there first. This guy would be willing to sell it to you at the equilibrium price, but at this ceiling price, it's just not gonna be worth it for him. So here's two people in the economy who could make a positive sum transaction. Value could be created here, but it doesn't get created. This is gonna result in deadweight loss, just like the previous example. And again, this is waste, this is value that could have been created, but we are now prevented from doing so. Now, you may have heard some rhetoric about price ceilings in light of the recent inflation. In fact, price ceilings are a very common temptation for governments facing high inflation. 
when the United States had 14% inflation in the 1970s. Richard Nixon, president at the time, decided to put a price ceiling on gasoline. Politically speaking, when gas prices are high, the president gets booted out of power, and so Nixon wants to make sure gas prices are low before re-election. What kind of effect does this have? Well, gas prices got lowered, but we see situations like this. Now there's huge lines at the gas station. There's not enough gas to fill up all the cars who want to fill up at that price. And so there's shortages, right? We have a situation where gas has to be rationed, not to the people who value it the most on the margin, but to people who have even numbered license plates on one day, people who have odd numbered license plates on the other day. And if your license plate ends in the wrong number, it doesn't matter how willing to pay you are, you just can't get it. Similarly, in industries today where costs are kind of out of control for reasons we talked about a few classes ago, one common temptation is to just say, all right, let's just make it illegal to sell at high prices. Let's make it illegal to raise prices. What does that do? In situations where we have price caps on medical services, that leads to shortages. In countries where there are price caps on medical services, you see things like long waiting times. Waiting is an alternative to price as an allocation mechanism. But if the mechanism is waiting, that's not efficient, that's wasteful. Because it doesn't matter how much you value getting whatever operation done earlier rather than later, you just can't do it, right? This is also a very frequent temptation in developing countries that have high inflation in necessities. Lukashenko, for example, is facing high inflation in Belarus, knows that people get dissatisfied when prices of necessities are too high. And so what's the easiest thing to do rather than fix the root of the problem? Well, just make it illegal to raise prices. What's the result if this happens? Well, empty food shelves. We saw this in Venezuela. When Venezuela responded to its hyperinflation by capping the price of goods and services, right? If prices are rising too quickly, we'll just make it illegal to raise prices. But what does that do? That leads to shortages. That leads to empty shelves. That leads to people not being able to get food at all, as opposed to just having to pay more for food. So the easy way out is almost never the right thing to do. Again, at any price other than the equilibrium price, there are gonna be people who are making plans that they can't finish. They don't know which plans they can finish and which plans they can't. So maybe you're willing to buy something at the current price, but you can't get a hold of it. Maybe somebody wants to sell something at the current price, but now there's nobody who's willing to buy it. This leads to inefficiency. This leads to conflict. As opposed to when prices can do the work, of coordinating behavior. Then we satisfy as many wants and needs as we can, and people can make plans that they can complete. And that equilibrium price is not just arbitrary, right? Prices are not arbitrary. Prices communicate information. And when you start directly fiddling with prices, all of a sudden you're throwing a wrench in people's plans. And that price isn't doing its job of communicating information about scarcity. So let's sum up. What we've done here over the past few lectures is we've built up to one of our most important tools in economics. This is going to allow us to explain changes in price and quantity in any market. And if we can tell a story about how such and such factor affects either consumers or producers, we can predict how price and quantity will respond to any kind of shock to any market. This also allows us to tell a story about how people come to reconcile their plans with each other. How I can make plans without knowing anybody that my plans depend on, but that still have a reasonably good chance of succeeding, right? I can just go to the store without announcing in advance what I'm going to buy there, and that will be available for me. Why? Because prices lead the store to anticipate my wants and needs, and my willingness to pay those prices motivates the store to try to do that. And finally, this also gives us a tool to talk about failures of coordination when prices are prevented from adjusting. We're not assuming an equilibrium price, right? In fact, if we impose a non-equilibrium price, we can show exactly how things will go wrong and the kind of waste that will be generated in the economy and the wants and needs that we're going to then miss out on satisfying. So when we come back next time, 
So far, we haven't said anything about the shape of the supply and demand curves. We could have steep ones, shallow ones, and those mean different things for the process of bargaining, for how much producers and consumers react to changes in prices, and what mix of changing price and quantity is going to fall out of any given shock. So that's going to be our unit on elasticity, and we're going to be able to say things about different kinds of supply and demand curves rather than just using a generic supply and demand curve for every market. So we can do a lot more interesting things that way when we start to think about shapes. Until then, enjoy your day and I will see you then.